I am Mr. Lika, Rabbi Vincent P. Adams, and I'm co-founder of Vince IN, the Tree of Life, along with my lovely wife, Navia Leslie Adams. And we want to welcome you to our Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, we're involved in a series uh, called Spirit Realm Realities, in which we are dealing with uh, spiritual warfare, particularly uh, in affecting deliverance, uh, freedom and emancipation from demonic oppression and attack of all kinds, whether it's against your mind, your body, your finances, your relationships, it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, all, all comes from heaven, all this good is coming from heaven, everything that's bad in life is coming from the enemy, mm -hmm. from the adversary, Hasatan. And so we um, go over strategies, and the methods by which we can defeat it. It's been laid out for us by, you know, in the Bible, by Yeshua, and in both the Tanakh and the Brickhide shop. And before we get on that, I ask my son, boy, has, uh, give me something from the gun rack over there. Give me something far. from the gun rack, from the, from the spiritual gun rack down there. Sure. Pick out one for me. Care. Okay, you want, you want me to blast them with this one today? Okay. Amen. <laughs> okay. Well, according to Scripture, before we go into battle, we're commanded to blow the holy shofar to ensure ourselves of the victory. So we are getting ready to go into warfare right now, so I'm going to blow the shofar to ensure ourselves of the victory. Baruch Atah, Yahweh, Elohim, and Malek, Koalam, Asher, Kitsun. Oh, Mr. Tom, Vitsi Vanu, Al Misfa, Shofa, Visha Yeshua. Amen. I don't want to lose my place. Boaz, you want to hold it for him? I guess I can. I Amen. All right, okay. Well, like I said, we've been involved in a series. And this is Sessions of Spirit Realm Reality, Session 19. Uh, I've already laid the foundation in sessions, uh, the previous sessions, especially. Uh, 16 and 17 with regard uh, to tonight's lesson. We've, uh, we're going to have a little bit of, of overlap, but not, but not a lot in this. And uh, my plan is during the month of February, this is the uh, first week of February, during the month of February, we want to get through all 16 strongmen. and going to try and cover four uh, strongmen uh, every uh, Wednesday evening, hey. if possible. Get your notebooks. Hmm. Okay. And it's not that hard. It's okay. not that hard. It, it won't have to go too long in order to do it, I don't think. And we'll see. But as I told you in my original uh, mentor in the deliverance ministry, it was a man named uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Pepe Maturi. And he was from his Africa, he was from the Congo. And he believed that biblically there were 16 strong men that were named in the Bible. And a lot of other ministries teach this, that same principle. Uh, either 16 or 12 to 16 strong men. Uh, 
in the biblical biblical record. And uh, Dr. Pepe believes that the reason why deliverance takes so long when some people do it is because they're they're doing it in an ineffective manner. And when uh, someone is uh, demonically oppressed, some uh, folk will, they'll buy anything and everything. They'll buy the spirit of ice cream, the spirit of this, the spirit of that. And true enough, a person can get free with that method. But if you buy the strong man and cast him out, these minor spirits that they control, that are under their command, automatically have to go as well. You ever seen the movies with eight, you know, where they're showing, you know, the ancient battlefield? If they kill the king or the general, the troops just surrender. And that's kind of, that's how it is in the spirit realm. If you get the higher up, you automatically, you know, roll up the, the little guys up under. So, what you need to do is to learn how to discern which strong man is operating in an individual. And you may say, well, how do, I, how do I do that? Well, you use the spirit of discernment. You use the power of the Holy Spirit, the Ruach of Kadesh. You may say, well, yeah, I don't, I don't really hear uh, from the Holy Spirit that well, okay? What, we, what I mean by that is observe. Uh, Reverend Pepe called this, Dr. Pepe called this uh, detection. What is the person, the person that you're ministering to? What are they presenting with? In the medical field, they'll say, what is the patient presenting? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, in biblical terms or in, in Christianese, so to speak, uh, we, we like to say, what's the fruit? Mm -hmm. Yeshua says, you'll know a tree by its fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. So what's the person presenting with? What, what do you see in the individual? If you ask the person a few questions about, well, you know, uh, why are you here for ministry? What, you know, what type of issues are you seeing in your life? What's happening in your life? You know, what's happening in your relationship? What's happening between you and your wife? What's happening between you and your kids, your co-workers, your boss, and your business? And by interviewing, asking uh, a series of questions, you can get an idea of what strong man is operating in a person's life by the fruit that you see in that person's life. You, you know, you're going you're gonna to see a pattern, and you will know. Just like when you, you go out, you know, uh, to an orchard. Are you in an apple orchard? Are you in an orange orchard? Are you in a cherry orchard? You can look at the fruit to know what type of orchard you're in. And when you do that, it's, it's relatively simple as to what strong man you're up against. Mm -hmm. Now, whatever, you can still buy that fruit, but I would cast, you know, either start from the top up, probably best to start from the top up. You know, buying a strong man uh, that you know or discern through detection or through spiritual discernment of the Holy Spirit. Buying that strong man first. And then you can get down to the fruit. And the only reason why you need to get down to the fruit after that point is it helps build the person's faith. You know, let, let's say that the person is uh, having having problems getting along with people. Uh, let me use a better. So give me a, give me a good example. Of, someone give me an example of something that, that somebody might be experiencing in their life. Hmm. You know, Religious. I got a good example. Oh. I'm trying to think of a, of, of, of a good one. 
Well, yeah. A good one. Someone who's maybe struggling with jobs, can't seem to keep a job. Can't keep a job. Okay, or you want more relationship type. You mean? Can't I, can't. Can't get along uh, with anybody. The, the, dog, or, the dog runs away. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying. I don't know why I'm drawing a blank. Normally, I, I, know, I normally have a bunch have, of these. Yes, you do. But um, oh, let's say, say something. Um, uncontrollable us. Uncontrollable lust. Ah, uh, uncontrollable lust. Um, I'm still trying to come up with a better one over there. Well, well what, whatever. After you bind a strong man, the thing that that person feels is tormenting them the most. You know, uh, whether it's lust or whatever, then you would say, bind the spirit of lust. But in the Bible, there's no such thing as a spirit of lust. There's nothing in the Bible that says spirit of lust. So what I would do in that sense, I would bind the spirit of whoredom, the whoredom spirit. That's what the Bible calls it. I bind, you know, at first I go right, right after the strong man, go right for the neck, go right for the head. Mm -hmm. And as Reverend Pepe would say, you know, if you want to kill a snake, you don't go for the tail, you go for the head. Right. So I go right for the head to the spirit of horror or the horror of spirit. Then once I deal with that, that's done, then I'll say the spirit of lust or whatever sexual perversion might be played in that person. Yes. And that's to build up the person's faith. If a person hasn't been trained or had these teachings and I say the horror of spirit, they might go, what the heck is that? I came here, you know, with a spirit of lust or, uh, or sexual this or that or whatever it may be. And he's or she is doing the whoredom spirit or something, you know. Uh, so after you go directly for the head, then you go down to the fruit. Okay? And it's just like the analogy of the tree. If you want to get rid of the tree, you don't just pick the apples off the branches. Right, yeah. Okay? You go to the root system of that tree. You pluck up the tree by its branches. Get it out. You know? Yeah. And, you know, you don't even have to worry about the apples at that point. Okay? But for the sake of the individual, in order to ignite their faith, after you go for the spirit of horror, go after the spirit of the apple to help build their faith, you know. You know, uh, Or Roberts used to say, he called it a point of contact. When he would pray for people to be healed, he would ask them, well, what do you want me to pray for? And what do you want me to do? Because some people, they believe that the man of God, man or woman of God, just just pray the words, do it. Then some people, you know, want to be anointed with oil, you know, and, and have hands laid on. And so you have to deal with that person's spirit, uh, not spirit, but that person's point of contact. That thing that ignites their faith, that one thing that ignites their faith, or, or two or three things, whatever it is. You want to find out. What does that person believe in their own mind and in their own heart will get them free? And if you can do it, do it. Because that builds them up more. It helps, you know, uh, it's the catalyst to ignite their faith and get it free. You know, nothing wrong with having, you know, your anointing might be more might be powerful enough to, to get them free. Um, some some deliverance ministers um, have been so anointed that when they walk in the room, folks start falling out and mm -hmm. manifest. Yep. Okay. If that's not you, you might have to talk to the person and say, mm -hmm. "Okay, what do you want me to do?" Okay, that's all right. As long as you get rid of it, that, that that that's okay. I'm very methodical. You know. What I, what I do, I don't care what you're presenting with. I'm going to ask. I'm going to know. We have a questionnaire that we have people fill out, and then we go through a very ex a long, 
interview process could take weeks, months, even. Because that's how Reverend Pepe was. I mean, my goodness, I started training with him in January, and he didn't do my deliverance until, I think, maybe June. He wanted to see how much I wanted it, number one. He believed that a person got to want it. Right. Okay. He said, if the person don't want it, it doesn't matter. It ain't, it's not going to leave. Because, you know, that, that unclean spirit just say what he or she wants me here. You can't cast me out. They want me to be here. Unclean spirits, they're very legalistic. You know, one of the reasons why we have the questionnaire is to determine what the legal ground is. Because, you know, we want to get, you know, get rid of that legal ground that gives them a hook, and then they come out easier. Yeah, if they were, if, in other words, why are they there in the first place? Getting rid of them is pretty easy. Especially when you find out the reason why they're there in the first place. And plus, you don't want them to come back. If you don't destroy the legal ground, they can just come back. The name of Yeshua gets rid of them. Okay? But they can come back as well. Yes. After a period of time, they come back seven times worse. Yes. Okay? So, we want to find out what is this person operating under? Which strong man? And like I said, I'm, I'm very methodical, very detailed, very uh, Meticulous. Uh, organized. <laughs> I might just, I was thinking today when I was going over to you, I, think, I said, I think what I'll do, either I'll have a checklist in front of me, or I'll just write all 16 strong men on the board, depending on where I'm doing the deliverance, and we'll just check that. We're going, to, we're going to go through all 16, okay? Mm -hmm. That way, I, I, you know, I know I'm going to get it, mm -hmm. okay? <laughs> I'm going to go through all 16, whatever I've seen on your questionnaire, whatever the Holy Spirit reveals to me during the course, because the Holy Spirit almost always during the delivery session is going to be talking to you. You're going to get something. I doubt very seriously if you go to, into a deliverance session, you know, ministering to someone that you don't get something. You may not know it, or you may not recognize it, but the Holy Spirit is going to be operating through you. And you're going to be doing, you know, something will just come to your mind and you just may do it. And you may not even realize that it's the Holy Spirit operating through you. But more than likely, uh, you know, you're going to be aware of something outside of yourself operating through you. And you really, if, you, if at all possible, you should be doing deliverance uh, with at least one other individual. You know, it doesn't hurt to have two or three. We used to work in teams of like uh, at, at least uh, three. We'd have one person who was actually, you know, going head to head, you know, with the demonic force. Mm -hmm. And we have like a tag team partner for him, you know, might step in on, on something. Then there was someone, uh, this is how, you know, I started, who'd be taking notes, who'd be listening, you know, might just sit, be sitting there praying in tongue, who'd be listening, just trying to hear something from the Holy Spirit. He ain't trying to, he or she's not trying to do nothing but hear from the Holy Spirit. You're not, you're not binding nothing, you're not, you know, going, you know, going head to head, you're just sitting there, you know, you know, focusing you know, their entire being on hearing something or observing, you know, maybe it, uh, the Holy Spirit may just tell them, uh, you know, look at their leg, or, you know, see their leg shake or something, you know, and, you know, while I'm up here finding something and casting out and standing and, and going, you know, you get kind of emotional. You may not see certain things or you may not readily hear certain things. So if you got somebody just standing back, like almost like a coach would on the sideline, who can see the whole field, and might be you know not, you know exiting on for you, yeah. And then when I would uh, 
that person, or like when they had me in that position, I would, they, they gave me some sticky notes. And I would write down notes, hey, do this, do that. And I would hand them to the second. And then he or she would tap the leader and hand in the note and step in or whatever. And, and we, we were working like that. Okay. Very, very organized. And, you know, and we would get things done in like, uh, like an hour. Now, I, I, I really haven't been in, a, in just one session with um, going two, three hours. Okay. Now, sometimes we had individuals only in town for like a few days, and we had to we had to do uh, the entire interview process in like a day or two. Now, in that format, yeah, it was you know three hours today, three or four hours the next, you know, because we we haven't had our normal uh, uh, time that we that we normally like to take and go through things. Because we don't like to leave anything behind because you leave something behind and you cast it out and don't get to that root system, like I said, it's coming back. Or can come, can come back. And so we take our time. Because I used to go, I said, why are you taking so long? You know, I want to blah, blah, blah. And they said, and Reverend Pepper used to you tell people, you said, well, you know, hey, this long. <laughs> you know, why are you in a rush now? <laughs> In the head for how long? I call out the senior. In the head for the last five years, ten years. Why are you in such a rush now? And he he would he would take he, he would not go into the delivery session if you hadn't come to his class like I'm doing now. If you hadn't been coming to his class and been learning about the process and showing that you because he said when you do that you show that you really want to be delivered. And I was going through my notes today, you know, my notes, he was saying how um, just come to the class, if you just come to the class, by the time you get through with the class, with all the things I'm going to be teaching and doing, uh, he said, you may, you may find yourself free at the end of the class. Because, yeah. you know, the thing that I was going for uh, at the time, it just went away. It went away like after the first week of class. And the class was like from January uh, to April. Uh, I was set free like the first week of class. I didn't even know. I got like midway through the class or, or to the end of the class. And I was like, you know, that hadn't happened. I'm good. I, wow. Okay, cool. You know, I didn't even, I didn't even realize. You realize your blessings start to increase in your life. You know, Say what? You notice the blessings increase in your life. You notice this. It difference. was just gone. Nothing. You know? I said, well, and I, I remember asking about this. I said, well, Vincent, you know, you did everything we told you to do. You came to class. You recited the prayers every day. You know? And it's, it's almost like you have heart trouble. You got high blood pressure. Okay, you can um, you can take the medication mm -hmm. to keep your high blood pressure down, all right? Or you can take the medication, exercise, diet, lose 50 pounds, and next thing you know, you don't have high blood pressure no more. Yeah. You know, you, um, you don't need bypass surgery, you know? You, you, you stop eating the wrong food, you took the cholesterol medicine, next thing you know, they say your arteries are clear. So you don't have to, you know, have a major surgery, a major spiritual event. You just get clean. Right. Little by little. Amen. I get clean. Okay. So you can have an experience like that, or you can have, or, or you can go with the operating team, with the emergency team, like we used to have, you know, with three or four people, you know, Got to hold two, you or down. Three, two or three people <laughs> praying, <laughs> you know, hold you down, yep. one person standing on his head speaking in tongue, the next one laid out speaking in tongue, everybody trying to get you, get you set free. 
Hey, I got like that. Well, it's a good success story, man. I, I had to, um, he, I mean, woo, um, <laughs> he's serving the Lord now, too. He's in ministry. I serve the Lord. He, uh, they came and they said, there's a, there's a guy, but you don't want to come in. It was scheduled for the deliverance set. We had like a deliverance set. We had like maybe 100, 200 people. And we had so many church folks that had been trained uh, over the past four months to get ready for this deliverance Saturday. And he was one of the, I don't know, 200 or was it 50 people? It was 200, 200 or 300 people there, you know, and maybe 50 or 70 of them was there for deliverance and the rest was, was workers, you know. But we had like, you know, three uh, ministers, three or four ministers per person. And we had two shifts. We had a morning shift and we had an afternoon shift of people coming in. And they came to me and they said, so and so is outside, but you don't want to come in. He, he's over, uh, there was a, uh, a quick trip next to the church. That's like Circle K here, convenience store. So he's at the uh, big guy. He's over at the quick trip. He said, but I said, well, I'm going to get him. I'm going to talk to him. So I went, I saw him and I said, Hey man, what's up? What's happening? He said, Oh, you know, uh, Vince, how you doing, man? And blah, blah, blah. I said, You ain't coming in. He said, Nah, man, nah, nah, nah. I said, All right, okay, okay. I said, Well, do me a favor, man, give me a ride back to the church. It's just across the street, right? I said, Give me a ride back to the church. <laughs> he said, Okay, all right. So he gave me a ride. He rolled up to the front door. And then I said, uh, It was a van, so I slid that door back. I said, Man, you sure you don't want to come in now? And he's like, uh, you know, just for a minute, he's like, oh, no, nah, no. Nah. And he had this little girl with him. And she said, yeah, daddy, come on, let's go in the morning. I want to see so-and-so or something. And so he said, oh, all right. So we got him inside. Then somehow I got him in the sanctuary. Then praise and worship started. I was in the back. He was up toward the front. And all of a sudden, he just took off, headed for the door. I mean, and I jumped in front of him just, just like that. I didn't hit him or nothing. I just got in front of him. And he just stopped. And he bent over right then, you know, so I kept talking to me. All right, I said, man, it's okay. It's going to be all right. And we walked him outside into the hallway. And he was just bent over. Then we took him to a room and we started in on Okay. <laughs> got him set free. I, it was, I think it was under an hour. Wasn't that long? Got him set free. And he told me later, he said, when he took off running, he said, that thing in him was so afraid of deliverance. That demon didn't, didn't you know, didn't want to, you know, step up in the church because that demon knew his time was up if he if he stepped in that church and went through, you know, through deliverance. And he said, he said, Vince, when you stepped in front of me, he said, something hit me so hard. I didn't touch him. I just stepped in front of him. Mm -hmm. He said, it was like when I played football and I took a hard hit and had all the wind knocked out of me. You know, I couldn't, you know, you don't want the other team to know that you hurt. He just kind of, you know, just stayed there like that, bent over. He said, that's why he was bent over. Wow. He said, something hit him that hard. Stop. It must have been an angel. Because mm -hmm. he was running full force. Big guy. He was running full speed. I just went like that. Boom. Stop. You serve the Lord. You serve the Lord now. Hallelujah. He and, he and his wife. That little girl. So she got a, she got her degree about two or three, yeah. a couple a year or two before Olivia. Before my old was born. Last year. Got her degree from old you. She whole family doing wonderful. Just wonderful. And he had he was going to make him kill people. There, he wanted to kill the deliverance instructor. Demons used to try to tell him to kill her during the class. And you remember after he got free, he told us, I, I used to just have a dream. I was just going to kill, you know, the demon was just telling me to kill you. Yeah. So, what was the point of me telling that story? I forgot my point. No, what just, was I talking about? You were just telling it, giving a story of. Of deliverance. What was I talking about, brother? He was in the point of deliverance. Yeah. Huh? The sermon and deliverance. The yeah. sermon? Okay, I know the sermon. But why did I tell that story? It was just, it was people. 
Yeah, it was just an example of people just being, just how it just manifests. Some wild ones. It was just about being some wild really manifestations. Wild we talked about some wild manifestations. Some wild demons manifestation. just holding people down. We got that, you know, we had, you know, talking about how, you know, some people you got to hold down. Talking about surgery. First you're talking about surgery. People have to go into surgery. And he says, you don't really. Yeah. Yeah. And then it's like, well. A major surgery. Right. What was you about to say? Uh, no, I just thought about, the, you know, the, the process of deliverance and then. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. You could just come into to the classes can get you set free right. where you don't have to have necessarily a major event. Right. Okay. Just do you everything just, you're supposed to do. Just get free. And it helps resist the enemy so he will eventually flee without having to go through all this major drama. Yeah. The, it doesn't have it doesn't have to have to be that way, you know. But okay, in in session um, sixteen and seventeen, we listed the sixteen strong men mm -hmm. and we gave the scripture reference to uh, each one. And Reverend Pepper used to say, one reason why you want to know the scripture reference, you want to study, you do have to study. And Reverend Pepper believed that in a lot of instances that by knowing the scripture that refers to a particular uh, demonic force or unclean spirit, he said, one, you'll get, you'll get that demon's name. And you do need to have his name. Okay? You do, you don't, you do need to buy, you know, because there might be four or five demons up in there, and you might say one of them's name and get him out of the rest of it. He called my name, man. He going over you know? Because they're legalistic. They're very legalistic. You know, so you need, it's like a court of law. Because you're really, what you're really doing when you're taking someone through deliverance, it is warfare, but it's also, you also be before the heavenly court. You know, because I can't reach in and, and just grab a demon, right? Mm -hmm. Okay? So there has to be angels on assignment to do that. So you're, you, you, you know, you're at the heavenly tribunal. You got, you presented a case. You're taking away the legal ground. Now this person has renounced that, you know, that curse that his grandfather uh, placed on the family in order to make money, you know, gave up his, you know, his children's children's children, you know, to a curse so that he can, you know, get money or get this or get some type of position or power. He's renounced that curse. He's repented. Okay, so that's taken care of. You know, that demon can't stay because of that. And then you're going to bind them to kick. You know, what does the judge do in the court? Bail him, take him out, lock him up. Mm -hmm. Okay? They come get, you know, after both sides present their arguments and everything. And, you know, the judge makes that decision. The bailiff or bailiffs are going to come, slap some chains on them, and take them off. And it's, you know, really spiritually, you're doing the same thing. It's a war, but it's a war of words. I forget where I heard this. It says, when angels war, they war with words. Yeah. And what is the sword of the Holy Spirit, the Scripture tells us? The Sorry. Word of God. Mm -hmm. You war with words. The rabbis say, for safety, they say, make an ark of words. Same thing. It's words. What you remember, the power of life and death is in the tongue. You build an ark of safety against the flood, the flood of the enemy rushing in and sweeping you away with words. Your words of faith, the word of God, the Hebrew, and you build an ark with these words. Okay? So you're in warfare. But it's a war of words, and you have to know the right words. You have, you need to know, uh, you know, the demon's name. Now, sometimes the Holy Spirit will do a work, a sovereign work, and a person can get delivered without that. Okay, but when you're going up against it, the words. That's why you need to know the scriptures. You need to know the Bible. 
he, it might be a tough case. And he's fight, he's fighting back. Oh, and the demon's gonna be talking. The demon will talk. Yeah. But you don't never want to listen to anything. Even if you ask the demon his name, and a lot of people in the beginning do that, but they say after a while you should get the name from the Holy Spirit or just go through that checklist. Because the demon will lie. He'll say, my name is such and such. You up here binding the wrong thing. What do criminals, first thing criminals do when they get arrested? They give a phony name. Hopefully they can get in jail and before uh, you know the authorities find out that they're holding Al Capone, <laughs> he get released, and they don't, you know, they don't, know, they don't, they don't know that they had this dangerous criminal. Mm. But sometimes the fingerprint record is the computer is down; they can't get this, and they let the person go. You know, that happens all the time. And when we watch the news. What happens? They let the, you know. Somebody will take the name of someone else and get, get, you know, a life, someone who got life is getting out because they got him mixed up with somebody who, you know, who stole a car for the first time to get released. So names are important. Mm -hmm. they're just, just like they're important in the natural, they're important in the spiritual. Names are very important. So when you know the scripture, you'll get the name. Then after that, You'll get the mission from reading the scriptures carefully. You'll find out what the mission is of that particular being. Because yeah. then once I know the mission, I cancel your mission against this person. I cancel the mission of this, that, and you know, I cancel it. Well, we know the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to ruin okay. our lives. Yeah. But they do it in different ways. So by knowing the name, I can know the mission. And that mission tells me how to pray. What I, you know, what words I need to use. And we're also, it will also give you some. It may not give you all four all the time, but it may give it, it may give you a couple of these. The third, the manifestations. Remember when Yeshua healed the boy? It, you know. The Shilly King, the apostles couldn't heal. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they couldn't cast it out. And so you, you should have, oh, how long will I be with you? Uh, he, he said, he, he interviewed the father, he went through protection. How long has he been this way? Okay, what does he do? He said, some should say he'll fall out, he'll foam at the mouth. Sometimes he try to throw himself into the fire, try to kill himself, you know? Remember that young man that, that you told me about? He was running, what did he do? Run out in the traffic. Mm -hmm. He was with his mother's cars, speed by, he'll break loose from them and just run in the traffic. Okay? So he knew, he knew how long he, the boy had been that way. He knew the manifestations, you know, uh, that, that was going on. He, he was getting information. So a lot of times, you know, got questions. Okay. Um, stop me anytime you got got a question. He was getting he was getting that information. Okay, and and of course, uh, when you get all of that, you pretty much know, you almost automatically know how to deal with it. Once you get that, when you get the name, the mission, the manifestation. Okay, and then it, it, the scripture might just tell you how to do it. So those four things. You want to, you know, you, you want to study the scriptures, so you can, you know, get a, a, a level of discernment about this. You have to know your enemy, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, the first one we're going to deal with. What, what's, what, what time is it? What's my time? Eight o'clock. Okay, I think I can get through these. Just took my finger off the page when I got ready to talk. But I'll find it again. Give me a moment. We're going to deal with the spirit of jealousy. There's a 
as soon as I find it in my notes. Here again. Now, in lessons 16 and 17, it was a lesson 18, but that was on uh, one of the feast days, and it dealt more with uh, the demonic realm from the feast days. So, if you go to our YouTube channel, you will, uh, here it is. If you go to our YouTube channel, Mm -hmm. uh, go to uh, Spirit Realm Realities lessons, lesson 16 and then the one on lesson 17 if you want to get the other background where I list out all 16 and uh, give you a, uh, a the biblical reference. But the uh, spirit of, of jealousy we find that in Numbers chapter 5, verse 14. Okay? And the manifestation of a spirit of jealousy is one, rage, mm -hmm. anger, mm -hmm. competition, restlessness, hate, division, envy, and murder. One, one more time. The manifestations of the spirit of jealousy is rage, anger, competition, restlessness, hate, division, envy, and murder. And as Reverend Becker used to say, why do people kill? Because they're jealous. They're jealous. That person had something that they want, and they tried to take it from them, or they didn't want to see them have it, or they had something that they, they didn't want them to have, even if they had it themselves. They, they wanted to be the only, the only one. So if you see a person who's angry all the time, upset, you know, quick to fight, quick temper, now most people will want to, what would they do? Uh, they want to bind the spirit of violence or a spirit of anger. But what they should bind is the spirit of jealousy. And then deal with anger, violence, murder, you know, the manifestations. Don't get caught up binding and casting out manifestations. It's okay to do it. But you'll be working. To increase, <laughs> huh? What'd you say? Yeah, if you do that first, you'll, you'll, I know. Yeah, it's but okay to, to do it to um, ignite the faith of, of the individual needing the ministry. But first, like, like Reverend Pepper said, go for the head. You really don't want to get caught up with the manifestations first because it's going to be harder to get them out. Right. So you'll be spending valuable time on the spirit of anger. Boy, you'll be praying, you'll be coming up with, you know, making that arc of words and, and you know, doing all that and wasting your energy and time, but then he'll, he'll, he'll go. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, hey, Go, you know, go for the spirit of jealousy right out, right out the box. Okay? Yes. Then next, we have the lying spirit. Sometimes you'll see the same manifestation um, in different strong men. There's another thing. When you have one demon, you probably have two or three others. Or more. The Bible says a threefold cord is not easily broken. Uh -huh. So we'll get to this much later on in the teaching. We, you know, first we're identifying the strong men. Then we're going to have a teaching called spirit groupings. You know, they like to group together. If you got this one, you can. You probably got this one too. 
spirit, you know, spirit groupings. All right. Okay, the lying spirit. Second Chronicles eighteen twenty two. Second Chronicles, verse eighteen. Excuse me, chapter eighteen, verse twenty two. Now this one might shock you. Okay, the line of homosexuality. Now homosexuality will also be under uh, the spirit of perversion. Mm -hmm. But what's the main thing operating in someone who has a homosexual spirit? Maybe I shouldn't say the main thing, but a big thing. It's a lying spirit. Something has told that person that, that, he, that he is a woman or she is a man or he likes men and she likes women. Something has lied to him to get them to, to begin to operate in that thing. They're operating under a lie. Or they feel that God made them this way. True enough, you may have been born that way. But that was not God's intended plan for you. Something has lied to them to get them to think that way. So a lying spirit, one of the manifestations would be homosexuality. Uh, fornication. They believe it's okay to have sex without benefit of marriage. Something is lied to them. Not hurt nobody. Consenting adults. All lies from the pit of hell. I read an article today, this morning, about a whopping... Speak up. A whopping 75% of the young adults today, even Christian believing, believe fornication is okay to, to shack up. Fornication is okay. They believe they did a white. They did a wide. I don't know nationwide survey of young Christian Americans, um, single. You know who are living together. Basically, they believe living together is okay. Seventy-five percent. Lies here. And it's, it's just getting worse. The generations. That's why I was so. There, there was a TV show. Me and Leslie both like. And I even hear some good Christians uh, quoting the characters from the show. Seems harmless. The show seems harmless. It's called the Big Bang Theory. You ever see it? In that show, fornication is okay. Now they're not showing any nudity. They don't get too graphic or whatever. They, they barely show a kiss. But <clears throat> you know that they are fornicating. So TV shows like that, you know, they're chipping away. They've been doing. And I hold it is they're chipping away at our morality. I, I tell myself, I you know I try not to watch any TV show that promotes sin of any kind. You almost can't watch any TV. Because, you know, even if it's a good show and they don't promote any sin, they're going to have at least one, one or two shows during that season where they do. I don't care how family-oriented the thing is. They're going to slip one in there on you. You'll be sitting there watching and thinking everything's okay. Uh, I, was, I like Blue Bloods. Blue Bloods was okay. Then all of a sudden they had a show where they um, saying homosexuality is okay. <sighs> Where the cop, he's, he's protecting uh, a homosexual guy who's in the closet. He's an actor, but he's homosexual. He's leading this uh, secret life. And he tells him, hey, what you do, you know, in your private, that's your own business, you know. They, you know, they don't have any condemnation on it at all. Right. That's the main thing. No condemnation, no we don't want to condemn in a church. If someone's confessing, you don't want to condemn. But the other ten shows conviction. were just fine. Just that one. And that's all you need. 
for a seat. All you need is one seat. Yes. Okay, but if you watch TV, you get one seat on Monday night, you get another seat on Tuesday night, you get another seat on Thursday, and you get another one on Saturday. Okay, for one show. You get a, you get a seat every, eat, you know, just one little seat from each show. If you're watching two, three shows a night, you might get two or three seats a night. Even though you're watching, I don't even hear anybody talk about the family hour anymore. Mm -hmm. There is no family hour. Huh? There is no family hour. Today. They never stop doing that. It used to be, uh, I think from like seven to eight, they couldn't show certain types of so I don't, I don't hear anybody talking about that anymore. Right. You know? Back so, in the day, maybe we watched Cosby show or, yeah. you know. Um, that lying spirit <clears throat> is in there. So we got fornication, profanity, vanity, strong illusions, exaggeration. Some people, you know, have to exaggerate. They got a mild fog of a lying spirit. It's, it's their waiting to when it can be activated. May not be big. You know, vain imaginations. People who don't want to lose an argument, they always have to be right. People who want revenge, they believe revenge is okay. Isolation. We're supposed to be in fellowship with one another. Don't forsake, you know. How does that go? Don't forsake, Don't forsake the assembly. Don't forsake the assembly of the saints. Amen. We're not supposed to be in isolation. Right. Deception. Sorry. Any sexual act other than coitus is sodomy. Oral sex, anal sex. That's sodomy. That's not a Christian definition. You can look that up in the dictionary. Superstitions. Superstitions. Hypocrisy. A religious spirit, person with a, a lot of legalism. Now, some people might say I'm into a lot of legalism because I observe the feast days, Shabbat, and I try to keep all 613 of the commandments. That would be, honey, because <laughs> you can't keep all the 613. You don't try to do that, honestly, because you know you can't. Yeah, of course. I, I, I want to try to keep all 613. But that is legalism. No. Because that's living by the law. It's not, that's not living by the law, keeping the command. Which one of the, you know, the Ten Commandments, which one of the Ten can I break? It's not about that. It's about knowing that you can't you know, I, do I, I, the 613 because you don't need. That's a lie of them that you can't. Remember, Yeshua came to fulfill the law. Not to abolish it. Fulfill, fulfill yes. means, like if I have a contract and I want to get paid, what do they say to me? Have you fulfilled all of the obligations of the contract to be paid? Fulfill means to do. He said, I came to do the law. And he did. He did all 613 Commandments he kept them all. to show that we can do it too because he was fully man, he was fully God, but he was fully man. He was tempted in the flesh just like we are. Then, what's the grace? We don't want to live by grace, we're just we're not under the curse of the law. Yeah, that's what we I'm still saying. should live by the, th the 613 commandments, we just don't have the curse of it. 
If you get caught fornicating, we don't take you out and throw stones at your head until you're dead now. You're not under the curse of the law. You have grace and mercy. Yes. But okay. we have a, I have a question. Well, let me finish. You have grace and mercy. And because Yeshua did it, he showed us that we can do it. Now, a lot of preachers in, in you know, a lot of traditional Christian churches, you know, they want to jump and shout, yeah, oh, he got up one Sunday morning, and just like him, you can get up. Uh, uh, okay, if he can, you know, if, if he can certainly get up from the grave, we can certainly keep the 613. We can, you know, we can eat right. We can watch, we, you know, we can eat kosher. We can keep the Shabbat. We can keep the feast days. It ain't that, it, you know, you, we have been brainwashed so much that the 613 is so hard to do. It was nothing super, you know, human about keeping the 613 commandments. But you're saying 613. You're yeah. not talking about the ones that we know that are beneficial in the spirit realm still to do today, that are ben truly beneficial. You're talking about 613 misfots that you're saying we should be doing today. And I don't mm. think so. Okay. Because you went through that yourself. We were going through them ourselves. We, yeah, said, we don't need to I do said, this one. We don't. You should not be doing this anymore. No, I never said you should not be doing it. I said we, we went through it. I'm going to do it again because we never got through them all. We were going through each of the 613 commandments. And the question was, should we be doing it? We went through, we, we addressed them one by one. Should we be doing this today? And my answer was on each and every one, yes, because there was a spiritual component. The way to keep them today may be a little different than it was same biblical times. Okay, so you're for saying... instance, the Jews, I, I don't, and I really don't know why on this point, the Jews no longer do animal sacrifices. And they say they don't do an animal sacrifice because they don't have a temple. So that's the only reason that they don't do it. I really don't see why that makes a difference. Because at one point in time, they just pitched a tent. <laughs> okay, so why don't you just why don't you just pitch another tent? Build it the way you were told to build it and do your animal sacrifice. But I believe that um, because of Yeshua's sacrifice, there's no need for the animal sacrifice. When we take communion, we are doing the sacrifice. Remember now, we, you know, we, we give the sacrifice of praise. Okay, so you're saying we're still keeping the 613 mitzvahs because we have Yeshua. That's what you're really saying. No, I'm not saying we keep it just because we have Yeshua. Some, uh, just the animal sacrifices are taken care of by Yeshua. But if you wanted to do the animal sacrifices, you could. But one thing you have to remember, when you go through the dispensation, In Adam and Eve's time, before they sinned, there was no need for an animal sacrifice because there was no sin. Mm -hmm. After they sinned, they had to have blood. Okay? Now that Yeshua has spilled his blood once and for all, there's no need for an animal sacrifice again. And, as, and also going through the dispensation, each dispensation, each period of time, biblically, God is trying to get us back to the Edenic state that we were in the garden. Each, if you look at the dispensation up until the time of Noah, mm -hmm. okay, before uh, up until Noah's time, you couldn't eat meat. You could not eat meat mm -hmm. up until up until after the flood. Then God gave permission. One of the reasons why the flood came was because some men, evil men, had started eating meat. You couldn't eat meat until the time, until after the flood. Then he gave permission. Okay, you can eat meat. Then the next dispensation, we get to the time of Yeshua. 
Now you, you eat his body, drink his blood. Then we get to the millennial reign. Death is put on hold for a thousand years. So there can be no sacrifice. Nobody's going to be eating meat. The lion is going to lay down with the lamb and chew cud just like the lamb. It's not going to be any killing. That's getting us back to the Edenic state. See, the first thing you got to do before anybody opens their mouth about which, about the law, they need to know what the law is. If you don't know what the 613 commandments are, you need to shut up. Because you don't know, you know, what you can do, what you, we'll be reading stuff in the 613 and you go, yeah, you should do that. It's the law. It's part of the 613. See, no one can, when, when anyone is put to the test and say, okay, we don't have to keep the law. Well, which one of the 613? I mean, no, we'll make it easy. Which one of the 10 can I break? Can I covet your wife? Can I covet your goods? You say, I don't have to keep the law. Give me your wife. Give me that new Cadillac you got now. I'm going to come over and take that new Cadillac. That doesn't you mean you go and sin. We all know about the scripture until Paul says, you know, you, you, does that mean you just go and sin? No. God forbid you just go on and continue sin. Okay. You don't sin. Go and yeah. sin no more, Yeshua did say. No, but that you, does, just call, you just mix Paul up with Yeshua. I went and said Paul and Yeshua too. Yes, I okay. said God and Yeshua Paul did say go and sin no more when he would heal okay, people. Okay, Paul said heaven forbid. He meant the 613. Remember, but what was the point of his that whole scripture? Paul, remember you got to go everything that Paul said. You got to go right and look at it through Second Peter chapter three verse sixteen. Peter said Paul's wisdom. He didn't criticize her. He said Paul's wisdom is hard to understand, and many people make make a lot of mistakes with it to their destruction if they haven't you know because they don't have training meaning they don't know the law they don't know Torah they haven't had instruction in Torah and they haven't had instruction in the law and the other thing you know Paul said you know don't let no man put you in bondage with the keeping of a new moon or a feast day or a Sabbath. And I, I, I was reading this because I'm, I'm going to do a series on this. I, I, it's got to be addressed because we've been so brainwashed against keeping the commandments or the law. We don't know what we're saying. And one of the things I kind of concluded, and uh, take this as a joke, okay, it seems like Paul is schizophrenic. Because if you read what Paul says and then you read what Paul does, it's two different things. In chapter 15, Paul is, you know, he's not saying it, but he's backing up what is said in, in, in chapter 15 of Acts, excuse me. In Acts chapter 15, he's basically coming against or supporting um, the decision for uh, no circumcision. Then in chapter 16, he goes right out and circumcises Timothy. And if you read all the letters of Paul, all the epistles of Paul, I'm coming against you. If you read all the epistles of Paul, you see that he's keeping feast days, he's keeping Shabbats, he's doing Nazarite pledges, He's doing all of the law. But yet when you read what he does, I mean read what he's saying, it seems like he's saying don't keep any of the law. Then I forget the, I, I forget the it's in Acts. They say, hey, you're here in Jerusalem now, and you know, you know what they've been saying about you. That you tell people not to keep the law. And he said, why don't you put it into those rumors and do X, Y, Z? Paul does the X, Y, Z in order to put aside the rumors that he's saying that you shouldn't circumcise. 
that you shouldn't keep the law, that you can eat things, that you can eat things, sacrifice to idols and strain. And Paul went through a process to show that that is not what he is about. Paul was the theologian. Paul was the, you know, the brainiac, you know, the person to get it complicated, you know. But he understood all the mental things he was talking about. But people who weren't trained in the law very well would misunderstand. Read the New Testament. Read what Paul does. Don't pay a whole lot of attention to what he's saying. And pay a lot of attention to what he's saying because he wrote some great stuff too. You know, we know that. I don't want to throw the baby out of the bathwater. But as Peter said, we don't, people don't understand Paul. They don't understand what he is saying or trying to teach. Paul kept the law. He kept the law. What was your question? <clears throat> you have to also consider Paul's te- uh, talking or teaching three audiences. He was teaching the Gentiles mm-hmm. who, um, who are now, you know, accepting Yeshua. Uh, possibly within the Gentiles during the time the temple was still standing. Mm-hmm. Orthodox Jews weren't going to allow the Gentiles to come and worship inside the temple. So, you know, so to mm-hmm. get them to be uh, to be more accepted of feeling sure, he probably said those things so they would understand that their salvation wasn't based on ritual or exactly, exactly, yeah, exactly. Almost. Okay, then you had the group who of the uh, Hebrews of the day. Who accepted Yeshua's uh, Messiah, mm-hmm. and then you had the Orthodox group; those three. So, in all in all, I think he was addressing all three groups in, in his statement. Um, go ahead. No, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Finish. Um, and then um, there was there's the case of uh, the Kalanasia the. Council of Nicaea. Council of mm-hmm. Yeah. In uh, 1680? No. 1600? No. Uh, the Nicene Council was 324. 324. 324. AD. Okay. And in, in the Hebrew, the Hebrews were not accepted. They were kicked out. That's the Nicene Council. Yeah. What I was reading to you, uh, Messianic Church Arising. Mm hmm. Okay. Yeah. They were kicked out of within. So, the translation was, been, was could have been altered. Oh, everything was altered. There's no doubt about that. And plus, uh, throughout Christian his, Christian history, after 324 A.D., you definitely completely lost the Jewish perspective. You lost the right way to interpret Paul. You didn't have people who knew how to interpret him anymore in the Christian belief. So for the next 1,700 years, we get people saying, oh, you don't have to keep, oh, you can't keep the law. You can't do it. Yeshua did. Yeshua came here here to show us that everything he did, we can do. And that we can do even more because now he goes to the Father. Greater things shall we do than he did. We're not under the curse of the law. We're not under the penalty of death for, you know, a violation like we were before. We're under grace. You got you got you got some time to repent and make up. You know, if you get caught in adultery, if you get caught in fornication, like I said, it don't take you out and stone you. What were you gonna really say? Yeah, when you were talking about we can do all that Yeshua did, that was referring to what? That was referring to the law. When you're talking about Yeshua, he said we can do all these things that he did. I yeah. thought that was referring to the miracles. Everything. Everything that he did, we can do. He came here to show us 
that we can live, live a sinless life through the Holy Spirit that indwells in all of us, that indwells in Him. And that means the law. Do you ever the problem, the problem is you've had 1,700 years of brainwashing. If I go in, and, and I, I'm intending to do this, I don't know what point. I, I think it has to be done because if I go in and I start reading you commentaries from the Hebraic roots perspective, it becomes abundantly clear that we're to keep the law. It's easy. It's, it's, not, it's not real detailed or tricky. Or, or tricky. Uh, it doesn't require you to know a ton of Hebrew. It is just what I have taught you with the seven W's. What did it mean? It's the seventh W. You know, what did it mean? Mm -hmm. No, the sixth W. What did it mean to who? When whom said when and where they were. Not what it means to us today. Not how we read it today. What did it mean to the people of the time? And when you look at the, from the Hebraic roots this discussion of, of it, it's abundantly clear. It, I mean, it's if I pull just pull something um, out right now, and we, I think next next week, I think that's what I'll do. Or either I'll do it doing. I'm gonna have to do it doing Bible study or something, because else this is gonna keep coming up. Because people's brainwashing well, is it, it, it is too extensive. I'm, I'm gonna have to yeah. address it, and uh, I would rather address things that are going to get you free right now. Things that are going to get you free from demonic oppression. Things that are going to get you healed. Things that are going to put money in your pocket. I would rather deal with that, but I, I think it, I, I'm going to have to aggressively deal with this other issue about uh, Christian theology or doctrine or Hebraic roots theology and doctrine because the brainwashing is just too extensive not to. It's, it's got to be uprooted. Yeah, yeah this is, it's just because it's when you first said that we should keep all the 613 mitzvahs but you're trying to distinguish the difference in those strong men about the spirit of legalism, people who, mm -hmm. or what was that linked to legalism? Those Good, people, glad you mentioned that. Okay, go you ahead. Know, you're talking about, you know, you have to understand, if you're saying we should keep the 613 mitzvahs, but you're saying that's not legalism. That's not legalism. At the same time, can you explain what legalism is then? Wow. That's a really good question. Okay. Just because you keep if I kept the Ten Commandments, let's, 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 let's deal with ten. 613, you know, y'all can only count up to ten right now. Y'all babies in this. You know, all y'all can do is one, two, three, mm -hmm. okay. If I kept the ten, would you call me a legalist? Folks would say no. For some reason, if I keep the ten, that's not legalism. And as I tell people, that when you know why you you do what you do, then it's not legalism. When you do it more from superstition, then it's, you know, everybody has to do it. It must be done this way. If you don't do it this way, and the exact same, and the exact way that I say to do it, then it gets to be legal. Even the keeping of the ten, we call that dog. Even in Christianity, even in so-called, uh, you know, grace abounding Christianity, you still have dogma. You must do things the way I say to do. The Baptists have particularly one dogma. You must be fully immersed. That's their dogma. Okay, if you're not fully immersed, if you don't go under the water, you're not baptized. That's their one dogma. Okay, uh, Pentecostals say that you must, uh, in order to, to have the Holy Spirit, you must speak in tongues. 
That's their dog. Okay? There are plenty of people who are going to go to heaven that may never speak in tongues. Okay? There are plenty of people who are going to go uh, to heaven who've never been fully immersed. Even the Baptists say you can go, if you go down, you know, a dry devil, you're just going to come up a wet devil. Even they'll say mm -hmm. that. And, but, their, but their main dogma is that you have to be fully immersed. Okay? I believe in full immersion too. I think, you know, but at the same time, uh, I think it was in Hebrews that says Moses sprinkled blood and water on the people in order to cleanse them. He couldn't dump the whole tribe. Just a little sprinkling got it done. So when you insist on your dogma that if you don't do it the way I say to do it, then you're automatically a legalist and you automatically have a religious spirit on you at the same time. Now, with um, the Catholics, if you're not in the Catholic Church, you're not recognized. Okay? A priest can't perform a marriage on a Catholic and a Baptist. The Baptist will have to convert to Catholicism in order for the priest to perform that marriage. Okay. Now, if you go to a Baptist church and there's a Baptist and a Catholic getting married, pastor ain't going to have no problem. But you can't do vice versa. You can't go, you can't have that Baptist go into the Catholic church and get married. Everybody has their dogma. Everybody has a little bit of legalism. And when you get, you know, at some point in time, when you get, if you get too much into that legalism that nobody, you know, else is right but you, you can, you can, you can let in, that's, that's opening the door to yeah. a religious spirit. Yeah. Um, what, what I'm gathering is, is this, is that from in the point of legalism is an observation of um, account, accountability to accuse if you don't uh, follow. If you don't do it my way. But, but grace and mercy is Okay, in accusing, your the intent is to hurt or harm, mm -hmm. or to, to tear down. Mm -hmm. But the grace and mercy, if if uh, you you know you don't uphold all the laws, then there's accountability, but in love mm -hmm. right. and mercy. grace, mercy, and acceptance. Right. Now that's good. Yeah. Now Paul even addressed that's that. When he said. <laughs> He who is of little faith, let him eat seeds. And if you have much faith, you can eat the meat. Now he was referring to, uh, as I was taught, I may discover something different when I do some more research on it. Uh, I've been told, and in most commentaries that you read, he was talking, he was addressing, there were some Christians who didn't want to eat meat. Mm -hmm. Because back then, the meat that you bought in the marketplace much of it had been sacrificed to idols. Mm. And, you know, the different priests or priestesses would take that meat that people would bring and they would sell it in the market mm. and mix it with all the other meat. So you didn't know if that meat had been sacrificed to an idol or not. And they were, even the new converts were prevented from eating meat that had been sacrificed to idols. So rather than eat something that had been sacrificed to an idol, they said, I'm not going to eat meat at all. And Paul would say, okay, though, and, and here again, Paul has said, hey, don't eat meat. I mean, don't eat meat sacrificed to idols. But here, here's a seemingly contradiction. Here he says, nothing is to be refused if, you know, uh, if eaten, you know, with praise and thanksgiving, if you bless it, you know, eat it. But he says, if you know that it's been sacrificed to idol, then you shouldn't eat it. But if you don't know, just bless it and go on about your business. Mm -hmm. Okay? That seems like a big contradiction. Mm -hmm. But he says, if you are around a brother who does not 
believes he shouldn't eat meat because he thinks it's sacrificed to idols, you shouldn't eat meat around that. You shouldn't put a stumbling block in front of your brother. Mm -hmm. Okay? Paul is hard to understand. You will be better off reading Paul and paying more attention to what he actually does. Is You know, he says this much, and then you read about just this much of what he does. Pay attention to most to this much. But he was dealing with, what, like Benny said, uh, the conflict between the different groups. You know, it's easy for a Jew to understand what he was saying and some things to do. That to him, to them, sin is totally, you know, from the history of understanding the Torah, they understand things. But to a Gentile, who's just, they're, they're going out into the world now. This is going out into the world and preaching the gospel. Mm -hmm. And so you're not going to impose impose the law on Gentiles saying you have to do this for salvation. No. The salvation's already done. This except Yeshua into your heart. So once those Gentiles or anyone in other groups, even the Jews, accept that. That Yeshua's he wants our hearts. This is what is salvation now. You don't have to gain salvation by doing the mitzvahs anymore. You're saved if you give your heart to him. That's the gospel, right? So the difference between Paul is saying, okay, to a Gentile, don't put a stumbling block, you know, before a Jew who, you know, who believes this, they should not eat the meat. To a Gentile, it's not a sin. So Paul's like, let's deal with this here. Whatever sin, if it's sin for him, then yes, it's sin for him. But if it's not sin for him, it's not. Because they're operating under the law of grace through the blood of Yeshua now. The Gentile, is, say, for example, is not uh, worried about eating meat. To them, it's not a sin. They have no conviction, they have no teaching. The, all they know is Yeshua has died for their, for their sins, that they can be gain salvation through him by following him. But that does not automatically mean that they have to do everything that's in the law because the Holy Spirit comes upon them and will lead them into all truth eventually in grace, in understanding, in patience, which is total love and understanding. For a Jew, it's the same thing, but to them, they're coming from a different history and background understanding of Torah. They already have great understanding of why they do not eat meat, for example. And so to them, like a sin for them, yes, they have the conviction. And, but yet they're still saved. They don't have to operate under the law, but they're still saved. So um, the main thing I think that's with legalism is that you just don't think that you're not saved uh, unless you follow the law. You say it by grace. So that's that's basically understanding the differences between the groups. Following the, group. the law will not bring you salvation. Right. It is not necessary for salvation. Okay? Let me make that abundantly clear. Right. As you just got through saying, though, um, in that, you know, Paul is talking to both Jew and Gentile. Mm -hmm. He's talking to Jews who may not, you know, he, that's why he said he was of little faith let him eat seeds and her. Yeah. It could have been, he could have been talking to a Jew who wouldn't want to do it because, you know, because he said, how do I know this meat is kosher? It could be a Jew saying that. How do I know this meat is kosher? Or it could be a Gentile saying, I know what goes on in the marketplace. They mix that stuff up. How can I eat it? It could be both. It could be evil one. But if you don't, you know, since you don't have, you know, we didn't have USDA back then, if you have faith, just bless it and keep going. Okay? And then the other thing, as you just said, uh, you know, back then, you know, he was talking to people who maybe didn't understand as much or know as much. And see, and that's where the problem is with the church. The church should, the church should be like an Orthodox Jew. The church should be keeping the 613. Amen. Because we're supposed to know better. We're not new converts. Right. Seeking truth. You know, we're not new converts. We didn't come out of, you know, uh, orgies and animal sacrifices and human sacrifices. Mm -hmm. We should know better. For real. We should be keeping, you know, they're wondering why autism is, has increased. Mm -hmm. I remember a friend, a colleague of mine said, he said, well, uh, he was a little older than me, about I don't know, 10, 15, maybe even 20 years older than me. Um, 
He said, when I was growing up, he's, he's from Gonzales, he was from Gonzales, Louisiana. He's gone on now. And he said, when I was growing up, there was two homosexuals in the whole parish. And they lived together. And when people would drive by the house to see them sitting on the porch together, folks would just laugh. <laughs> and keep on going. Nobody paying no attention. He said, it was two homosexuals in the whole parish. And he told me, he said, Vince, he said, it seems like there's two in every family now almost. Mm -hmm. I know a family, you know, they got one son who's a home, you know, they got two sons of a homosexual, and then and they got a daughter who's a lesbian. He said it was two in the whole parish. Now it seems like there's almost two in every in every family. Everybody seems to have one, and one in their family, yeah. One thing, like with autism, the increase in autism and other things and things that are going on, you know, the law, and the law says that you uh, you don't wear wool and cotton in the same garment. You don't mix the two. Now, if I told you I was keeping that, I want to keep that law. I'm, I'm going to start really reading the labels on my clothes. How do I know that some, you know, in physics we say that for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. The same thing is true in the spirit world. Everything you do causes a reaction in the spirit realm. And whatever reaction is in the spirit realm will soon manifest here in the natural. How do I know? what I'm preventing from occurring here in this realm by mixing fabrics like that. A lot of the stuff we're doing that our scientists are doing with our food in the law is said don't do that. GMOs. Right. The yeah. food, the clothing. It's the food. A, it's, it says don't, you the know, air. you know, stop this genetic hybrid with animals and, and everything else. Yeah. But if you don't, you know, one thing I read from a rabbinical source, God will never reveal to you the reason why he put something in the law if you don't do it. In other words, he's not going to come to you, uh, Brother Benny. Um, True, that's good. Keep the law, keep this, keep law number 10, and the Jews have the number, you, you, you know, Exact number. Keep number two, just like the Ten Commandments, like we have the Ten Commandments. They know exactly which one is which. Keep number 212, because by doing that, you do this. If you don't keep it, he ain't going to reveal it to you. Mm -hmm. If you keep it, you might get the revelation. He might honor that and give you the revelation. There have been certain rabbinical Jews who have gotten revelation on what they may, they, they'll tell you that. We may not know all of them, but we've gotten revelation on a lot. If we started keeping them, if we had, as a, if the church had kept the law these past 2,000 years, I believe we would have the revelation on all 613. He's not going to give it. Unless we do it, because it ain't this. Well, you know, why are you gonna give a reason to someone who doesn't keep it? Okay, what's my time? I want to finish these. Eight forty nine. He has to go. Yeah. Okay. All right. But uh, check out the record. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead. Thanks, Benny. Okay. Be blessed now. Okay. We, we went through uh, vanity. We, we, Getting back to the material. But that's good. I'll always stop and entertain questions and debate. No matter what material I want to get through. Okay. You know, that just lets me know what I need to address. And we you know, we're gonna we're gonna cover that. I, I, I see I, I have to we're gonna have to deal with that issue uh, straight ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, I went through vain imaginations. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
don't want to lose an argument. People who want revenge, isolation, deception, sodomy, superstition, hypocrisy, religious spirit, uh, condemnation, accusations, Brother Benny uh, brought up, and critical of the men and women of God, and esteem themselves more highly than they ought to. And of course, false visions and prophecies. Now these are manifestations of the lying spirit. Homosexuality, fornication, profanity, vanity, strong illusions, exaggeration, vain imaginations, don't want to lose an argument, want revenge, isolation, deception, sodomy, superstition, hypocrisy, religious spirit, condemnation, accusation, critical of the men and women of God, and esteeming themselves more highly than they should, and false visions and prophecy. Okay, now let me uh, get down here to the dumb and deaf spirit. Mark 9, uh, verse 25 and 26. Dumb and deaf spirit. Okay. Okay. A spirit of suicide, hmm. seizures, epilepsy, lunatic or insane, blindness, dumbness, convulsions. I already said, you know, insane, schizophrenia, hearing voices, mm -hmm. split personality, inner ear disease, foaming at the mouth. Okay. Um, split personality, deafness. Mm. Okay. Eye diseases. Those are the dumb and deaf spirit. Or it's one I left out of it. Oh, can't function. Uh, can't function syndrome. If, say, your right leg is paralyzed. In other words, the dumb and deaf spirit stops something in the body from taking place. Dumb and deaf is what, what is called in the scriptures. Dumb and deaf means you can't speak and you can't hear. You have lost the ability to hear and the ability to speak. It causes something to stop working. It can be total kidney failure. Something in the body has stopped functioning. That's a dumb and deaf spirit. We would also call that a spirit of infirmity. So a spirit of infirmity many times will accompany the dumb and deaf spirit. So, mm -hmm. I just want to make sure. I, okay, I did. I did cover all uh, that were that were in my list. Okay, so we've gone through three of the manifestations. Now we're going to do the spirit of Antichrist. First John, chapter four, verse three. First John, chapter four, verse three. Spirit of Antichrist, legalism, controlling the spirit, substitutes the blood, says we don't need the blood, you know, substitutes the doctrine of the cross for a, another religion. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's an Antichrist spirit. Speaking against the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Some Baptists do this, you know, they, they say the gifts are no longer in operation. Yeah. That's the spirit of Antichrist. Okay, suppression of ministry. You know, if, if, you know, if um, someone doesn't have the doctrines that they have, they want to, you know, suppress that ministry. Okay, atheist, agnostic, you know, blaspheme, persecution of the saints, self-appointment, you weren't called by the Holy Spirit to preach, to teach, to the fivefold ministry. You just elect yourself. New age, humanism, stubbornness, a spirit of pride is an example. Although this, okay, no, not the spirit of pride, but uh, take out stubbornness and the spirit of pride. That's what we're going to cover next week. I got into next week's. 
Uh, next week we will cover the spirit of pride, the spirit of bondage, and uh, two more. So we got in uh, four. We want to get in four uh, next week as well. So those are uh, the manifestations of the spirit of jealousy, the lying spirit, the dumb and deaf spirit, and the spirit of Antichrist. Okay. So we're going to end there, and we're going to um, pick up next week with the spirit of pride. Uh, I really want to get into that one. Uh, very important. So until then, and, and look for um, some announcements where we're going, to, we're going to deal with the 613. We're, we're going to go head to head with that. You know, because that, that's going to hold many of you back in terms of, you know, really going forward into the fullness. If you keep accepting that 1700 year old doctrine that came out of the Nicene Council in 324, it's going to hold you back from a lot of things. And going and going forward. Okay. May the blessings of our Lord and Savior be upon you. In Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.